Hey YouTube, my name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney and welcome to my channel. Today's video is going to be my analysis of the murder trial of Chandler Halderson. He's also known as Chaz. Currently, he is on trial for the murder of his mother and father, Bart and Krista Halderson in the state of Wisconsin, stemming from an alleged incident in which he reported his parents missing in July of 2021 and his parents' body parts were discovered throughout the state of Wisconsin. He was charged with their murder, the false report of their disappearance, as well as the improper disposal of their body parts. Halderson is represented by an attorney named Catherine Doral, and the prosecution's lead state's attorney is, and the prosecution's lead state's attorney is William Brown. The trial is now in its second week, technically on day eight of the trial, and just recently, Mr. Halderson was reported to have tested positive for COVID-19, which may cause the trial to be postponed or continue in order for him to recover and not test positive anymore. Another thing that could happen is that the judge could declare a mistrial and then impanel a completely new jury until after Halderson no longer tests positive for COVID-19, but that's unlikely. I would like to say that I've received about 15 to 20 requests from my viewers to look at the Halderson trial. In particular, I received concerns as to the performance of the defense attorneys, um, in particular, Ms. Doral, in their representation of Mr. Halderson. Now, this case was completely not on my radar. I had never even heard about this case. It's my viewers who brought this case to my attention. And so I decided not to read anything about the trial. So I just decided to just go into it and see what could the possible issue be with the way in which the defense attorney is representing Mr. Halderson. So Chandler Chaz Halderson is 23 years old. At the time of the offense, he lived with his mother and father, Bart and Krista Halderson in their home in Wisconsin. Chaz also has a older brother by the name of Mitchell, Mitchell, um, you know, had a relationship, had a job, and was no longer living in the home. But it seemed as though um, Chandler had some issues with leaving the home. Uh, the parents wanted him to pay rent, and this is where we saw him in July of 2021. So according to uh, the state's version of events, and this is what I'm going on based on the opening statement only, um, Chandler, because it wasn't contested by the defense, Chandler was living with his parents and uh, supposed to be attending college as well as working for a local employer and had recently accepted a job for SpaceX in Florida and he was working towards finishing his college degree. Everyone believed that everything was going great for Chandler on the outside. He also was working for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as a diver. So he was very active and had a lot of things going on and was work working remotely for his uh, job and also attending um, school, attending college. However, that all came to an end for Chandler when he got into an accident and suffered a head injury. As a result of that head injury, he had a hematoma on his brain. The hematoma needed to be drained and then that caused him to have some type of nerve damage which kept him from being able to walk being able to drive or being able to fly. So he was suffering from brain damage and nerve damage as a result of this accident and the treatment that he had to receive. Everything that I just said is a lie. That's all a lie. None of that was true. In July of 2021, I think it was July, uh, the July 4th weekend of 2021, I believe it was on July 1st, his parents, Bart and Krista, pack in a hurry to go to their vacation home or cabin that is many miles away from where they live. They were leaving to go with a couple of friends. Uh, Chandler didn't know who those friends were. Uh, he said that his parents were evasive about who the friends were and he helped them to pack up their trunk um, with a bunch of things that they needed, including a lot of money and some alcohol. He also said that his mother had recently received a cancer diagnosis. He didn't see exactly when they left. Apparently Chandler received a text message from his mother saying that she had arrived safely with the dad, 
that they were going to be going to a local parade. They also said the reason that they needed to leave in such a hurry was because the cabin had sustained some damage because of some weather related event and they needed to go there to go and fix it. Eventually, mom and dad do not show up for work and Krista, no calls, no shows for work, which is highly um, irregular. Chaz begins to speak with her uh, supervisor or employer at her job saying that, you know, Krista has confirmed that she is away at the cabin and that she should be coming back any day now. But the employer says that they're going to have to fire her because she's never called in to say that she was leaving on this emergency. Chaz then informs the employer that he is going to go and report his parents as missing. He walks into the local police station and reports his parents as missing. The police arrive at his home. They don't see anything that is out of, you know, the ordinary. And the investigation begins from there. They go to the cabin where mom and dad, Krista and Bart, were supposed to be vacationing with this mystery couple. And the cabin has clearly not been entered in a very long period of time. And throughout the trial, video is shown of the cabin. The cabin looks as though it's been the outside is completely overgrown. The inside looks as though it's dusty and no one has been in there. So this raises the suspicions. The background of Chandler Halderson begins to unravel and this leads the police to believe that there is a motive. Not only did Chandler Halderson not have a position open for him at SpaceX, he also was no longer attending college. He had dropped out after the first semester. So he was lying about that. And he also did not currently have an employer and the Department of Natural Resources didn't even have a diving team for him to be a volunteer member of. So everything that he said that he was doing, he was lying about. Police uncovered the phone records of the mother and the father. And apparently from the father Bart's phone records, he had been calling the school, pretending himself to be Chandler to get to the bottom of what was going on with Chandler and discovered that Chandler had not been attending the school. Chandler had been sending emails back and forth to himself from the school, making it seem as though he was having issues with, you know, his enrollment or issues with financial aid and things like that. He was also sending himself emails and text messages and phone calls back and forth from his alleged employer, because remember, he's supposed to be working. So he was supposed to be paying rent and he hadn't been paying rent. And so he was showing his dad these generic Gmail emails that weren't coming from a company account, but were coming from a Gmail account of people that were like misspelling their own names and things like that, saying that they were the human resources people for this employer and saying that they were having issues with his direct deposit or that because they owed him so much back money that they needed to pay him in a certain way. It's going to take some time. Time was running out with his family. They were starting to realize, especially his dad, that you know something was not right here, that Chandler was not living the life that he said that he was living, that he wasn't paying rent because he likely wasn't receiving any money whatsoever. And he spent a lot of time on his video game and not working. So he was supposed to be working virtually, but instead he was gaming. One of the people that he was gaming with was a former uh, service member who was abroad. That person came back to the United States and met Chandler in person and sold or gave a high, powered rifle to Chandler as either a gift or, or a sale or something like that. And um, so now Chandler was in possession of this rifle. Chandler's dad, Bart, scheduled an appointment with the college in order to have a meeting in person to get to the bottom of what the issues were with Chandler's enrollment. At this point, the house of cards were pretty much going to all fall down. Bart texted to Chandler on the day of the appointment, hey, um, I'm ready to go when you are. Like, we're, we're getting ready to go. It's time to go. The time has come. And that's the last text message that Bart ever sent. The mom, Krista, was not home at the time and was texting Chandler about things that she needed to do for him because he was supposed to be infirmed from this accident. Um, he was telling her to bring home soda. He was telling her, you know, not to rush to get home, basically and she came home a little bit later. It is alleged by the state that Chandler shot the both of his parents in the back of the head and dismembered their bodies. He then proceeded to attempt to burn their bodies in the fireplace 
neighbors reported smelling a pig on a fire and he was unable to completely um, incinerate their bodies because it's basically impossible to burn a human body in a fireplace. There were fragments of a human skull found in that fireplace and the door, the glass door to the fireplace cracked eventually. And they think that that was because of the excess heat coming off the body, which would be more than, um, you know, what a normal fire would burn. And it caused the glass to crack under the, the heat and the pressure. They believe that Chandler tried to create an alibi by spending time with his girlfriend at her family's farm around the same time that his parents went missing. Um, and he was with his girlfriend at the family farm sometime after the parents went missing. He then came back to the family farm um, on his own without his girlfriend asking to use the pool the next day. The family thought that that was strange, but they allowed him in because they knew him. He uh, swam in the pool and then he went off into the woods. In those same woods later on was one of the body parts of his father also found in that same vicinity, uh, I think behind a barn or something like that, was the gun that was sold to Chandler by his military friend. And then his mother's uh, legs were found um, in an area that Chandler liked to frequent. In fact, there are photographs of Chandler next to a tree that is in the same exact area where the mother's legs were found. It's a pretty bad case for the defense a pretty strong case for the prosecution. The mother's cell phone was found in the closet in Chad's house. So she's supposed to be away on this trip that she confirms that she's at by texting him. But actually it seems as though it was Chad text, excuse me, it was Chaz or Chandler texting himself from his mother's phone, just like he was sending emails to himself, right? So a similar MO to try and prove that he was working a particular job or attending a particular school that he wasn't, it appears that he was texting himself from his mother's phone to make it seem as though his mother was still alive when in fact she was already deceased. There was an ax with blood found on it in the property. There was dried blood found throughout the property. There's just so much more evidence that um, is um, going to be detailed in the trial and has been detailed in the trial. Those were the facts that were most laid out in the opening statement. The prosecution had demonstrative exhibits. So opening statements are not evident. They're only to state to the jury or preview to the jury what each side believes that the evidence would show and then to request the jury to find the defendant either guilty or not guilty, depending on what side that you're coming from. They set up the motive uh, very, very well. And it's very important to note to note that it's not necessary to show motive in order to prove someone's guilty or not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but the jury can consider if there is a motive, they can consider that in their deliberations and whether or not they think that the person is guilty or not. It's not necessary, but it can help the jury to reach a determination. The prosecution's motive that they have ascribed to Mr. Halderson is clearly that Mr. Halderson was on the brink of being discovered for his years of lying and deceit. The parents were going to be disappointed in him. He had a brother, Mitchell, who was doing everything right and he was doing everything wrong. He was needy for attention because his brother had been injured. He himself faked an injury. By the way, the brain damage was also supposed to be a faked injury, that there was nothing wrong with him. He was wearing a neck brace and saying he couldn't lift anything and walk before his parents went missing, but after his parents were missing, um, he took the neck brace off and was carrying bags of ice um, on surveillance footage. And the police believe that he used those bags of ice in order to ice his parents' bodies before he disposed of them. So they were clearly laying out this case. So now it was time for the defense to make their opening statements. And here's the thing to know about opening statements. Opening statements are not evidence, but the burden in the case always rests within the prosecution. So it's the prosecution's burden to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And honestly, a defense counsel could just get up there and say, please remember your burden, have a nice day and sit down because there's no burden on the defense to present any case. They don't have to present a theory of the case or anything like that. 
They really don't. And then that's something that it's hard for people to wrap their minds around. And sometimes it can be prudent not to present any version of events until you've heard everything that the witnesses have to say. Maybe you're hoping for a Perry Mason moment and that somebody will just, you know, blurt out, no, I'm the real killer, you know, and it wasn't Chandler, it was me, you know, something like that. But for the most part, most defense attorneys do try to come up with their own theory of defense. It is clear to me that the defense's theory of the case is that Chandler is not guilty of murder, but may be guilty of other things. And that's a tough case to make to juries. Sometimes you can make that defense of alternative defenses to a judge, which is, you know, you can find, you can split the baby and find my client guilty of some of these, but not of the most serious things. Judges have an easier time with that. Juries do not. So they like to hear that, you know, there's, you have a defense to this. You have a reason for why it's not you or why this didn't happen. So that's always tough, but that's clearly the defense's theory at this point in time that, oh, most of the things that the prosecution says are true but that Chandler is not actually the killer and that the prosecution cannot prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, on one hand, I like I've said before, this is a valid uh, defense strategy. It really is. I have some stylistic quibbles with how Miss Doral did the opening statement. So she did a lot of um, high soaring oratory about you know the Constitution and the reason for um, the presumption of innocence and the importance of keeping an open mind and telling the jurors that you have to be jurors and not people. I, I get it. I get why she said those things. You guys should watch it. I'll put a link in the description box down below. I get why she said those things. However, I think that what it does is it sounds like you don't have a defense and sometimes we don't. Okay, and, and ultimately, I think that's what this all comes down to. But when it comes to the opening statement, sometimes you just don't have a defense. The prosecution's opening statement was an hour long. The defense's opening statement came in around 10 minutes long. Your defense, your defense opening does not have to be long, but it should be cogent and coherent. And I think that sometimes we should stay away from that high-flying oratory. So I'll give you an example of an opening statement that I would give where the evidence is, in essence, overwhelming. So here, the evidence is, if all of it is admissible and the state will actually get their witnesses to say what they promised them that they would say, the evidence would be overwhelming that uh, Mr. Halderson uh, caused the death of his parents, uh, illegally disposed of their body, and then falsely reported that they were missing. So my example of a good opening statement would be, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is a case about assumptions. The prosecution wants you to assume that because Chandler Halderson is a video game playing loner, stoner, and nerd, that he must have killed his parents. Just because someone likes to stay home, doesn't like to work, and doesn't want to go to school does not make them a murderer. Sure, he could have been nearing a confrontation with his parents about the fact that he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. But that doesn't mean that Chandler killed his parents. Chandler has no history of violence whatsoever, and there has never been any report of any discord between Chandler and his parents before they were horrendously murdered sometime in July of 2021. And I say horrendously murdered because the prosecution has no idea exactly when Chandler's parents were murdered. That's right. If you notice in their opening statement, they never say exactly which day they're murdered because according to all the forensics reports, Bart and Krista were murdered sometime between July 1st and July 8th of 2021. Seven days. That is seven days in which anyone else could have murdered Bart and Krista while Chandler was away vacationing with his girlfriend and her family. All that the prosecution can point to you are examples of Chandler being a loner and a stoner. But what they cannot do is put that gun in Chandler's hands. What they cannot do is tell you that anyone saw him burying the bodies of his parents or burning his parents. What they cannot do is tell you that they saw Chandler shoot his parents because they have no evidence of that whatsoever. And what is that? That is reasonable doubt. 
When Chandler's parents went missing, Chandler was away with his girlfriend and her family. Then Chandler realized his parents were missing and he did the right thing. He reported it to law enforcement. And now they're trying to turn that around and make Chandler into some horrible monster that he is not. Because they don't have the evidence to prove that he is the killer. They never wanted any evidence to prove that anyone else could have been the person to kill Chandler. They never looked at any other suspects. Instead, they just rested on the fact that it was Chandler from day one, and they never looked at any alternatives. It is time to hold the state to their burden. And the only way to do that is to examine what the state has and what the state doesn't have. Oh, sure, they have a lot of evidence that Chandler is a loner and a stoner, but they have no evidence that he is a murderer. And at the end of this case, I ask you to find my client, Chandler Halderson, not guilty. Thank you. And then sit down. It doesn't need to be long. You just need to point out the things that the state cannot show. Ask the jury to keep an open mind and tell the jury to look for any inconsistencies between what the state promised and what the state actually delivered. So now we're moving on to the cross-examination of witnesses. So far, the state has called several witnesses um, to establish the initial crime scene, which is the house, um, the initial statements that were taken from Chandler, and the investigation in which they went out to the cabin, as well as statements from the employer of the mom, Krista, as well as the statements from the employer of Krista saying that she never showed up for work and that was not like her, as well as a flyer about the parade that the parents were allegedly supposed to be attending. The state um, did a pretty standard direct examination in establishing the facts so far up until that point that they had laid out in their opening statement. But when it came to the defense's turn to cross-examine, the defense on the first day of the trial only asked two questions, one question from two witnesses. That's it. And then they asked no questions of the other witnesses. There were about four or five witnesses and they asked no questions whatsoever of the other witnesses. I take issue with that. And here is the reason why. Cross-examination can be an amazing tool. Sometimes it's the only thing that a criminal defense attorney has in their arsenal in order to fight for their client. To give up on cross-examination simply because there are no good facts in the case, to me, is a dereliction of duty. They asked almost no questions. And so when it comes time for closing argument, when the defense tries to argue that, you know, look, they have no evidence of this or no evidence of that, whatever they do have evidence of, whatever the prosecution has presented evidence of, and, and even on day one, it's quite a bit, it is uncontested evidence meaning that the prosecution was allowed to lay their case and lay their foundation without a single question being asked to their witnesses. It's almost as though the defense just laid down and let it happen. We're all faced with bad cases from time to time as defense attorneys, and it's tough. It's really, really hard when you're faced with a bad case where you know there's just no forensics in your favor there's no investigatory evidence in your favor there's no physical evidence in your favor there's no magical witness that just comes out and says it wasn't your client it's tough you know your client doesn't have an alibi for the exact time of the murder it's very very hard however it is our jobs to find something out of nothing so a cross-examination of the officer who initially arrived to the crime scene would be something along the lines of, well, you didn't see um, anything disturbed in the house, did you? No. You didn't see any bleach laying around? No. You didn't see any blood? No. Obviously, you didn't see any body parts? No. So you're going to lay out that when the police first arrived, there was no evidence that any crime had happened. A defense here that you could be raising, aside from magically it wasn't him, 
is that it was someone else and my client is being framed. So it wasn't until after they started looking at my client that someone went and dumped things in the house to make it look as though my client committed the crime. Far-fetched, but it is a defense and it's much better than nothing. And juries at least appreciate, even if they don't buy your version of events, trust me when I say that they appreciate that you're putting on a case for your client. People want to feel as though there is a fair trial happening here. So you can at least ask questions geared towards what the police did and did not notice when they first arrived on scene. The case could be that the girlfriend did it. Although the girlfriend and her family say that girlfriend was el elsewhere when the crime was committed, when the parents were killed, you could certainly point to the fact that in opening statements, the prosecution said that the relationship between the parents and the girlfriend wasn't always perfect. As there were some times where maybe she wanted to stay over and they didn't want her to, or maybe he wanted to stay over with her and they didn't want her to want him to go over there. Um, they could certainly try to, you know, draw out, hey, the girlfriend is the one that said that um, Chandler's Snapchat put him in the location where the mother's uh, legs were found. We're just going off of the girlfriend saying that, you know, obviously they probably have some Snapchat re records, but what would be her motivation to lie on Chandler? Did she do this and then he covered up for her? Did did she uh, participate with him? Is she a, is she a co-conspirator? And so you should not believe her. You know, there really has to be something, an alternative suspect, anything that you have to draw out. And another defense that you could raise is that it could have been someone else that randomly came into the house and committed the crime while Chandler was away. He had nothing to do with it. He had no idea what was going on. Never looked for an alternative suspect. So you could say things like, well, you didn't look into anyone else other than Chandler, did you? You didn't interview anyone else as a suspect, did you? The moment that Chandler reported his parents missing, who else did you speak to other than Chandler? Those would be great questions to ask to at least raise some questions in the jury's mind like, well, why didn't they speak to anyone else as a suspect? Why didn't they interrogate anyone else? You don't have to call your own witnesses. That's completely fine. You don't have to call a single witness, introduce a single piece of evidence. But in my mind, you really do have to cross-examine. You have to, um, unless when the witness testifies, they do not testify to an essential element. So for example, an essential element would be that it occurred in this county in the state of Wisconsin, but the whole time all of the witnesses testify and none of them say that it happened in the state of Wisconsin. Well then at the end of the evidence, you move for a directed verdict because there was no evidence establishing jurisdiction or they failed to identify your client throughout the trial. So there was no evidence establishing that your client in the courtroom is the person that they're talking about, right? So maybe that might be a very rare instance where your prosecution really doesn't know what they're doing. You don't ask any questions on cross-examination in order to ensure that they're unable to clean up their mistake later on, right? You don't draw any attention to it. They don't notice it. You keep it to yourself and then you move for a judgment of acquittal at the end of the state's case. And nine times out of 10, the judge is going to go in your favor if the state fails to establish those basic and essential elements. Um, uh, barring something like that, you need to ask questions on cross-examination. So the failure to ask any questions whatsoever makes me think that they have no theory of the case other than we're just going to hope for magical reasonable doubt. It's our job to point to the reasonable doubt or make some up where there is none. And making some up might simply be, why didn't you question any other witnesses? You didn't have any other suspects. You didn't really believe that these people were missing. And so you never considered the fact that it could have been someone else that killed them in their own home, dismembered them and burned them in the fireplace. And it wasn't our client, right? Our client was at his girlfriend's house. He had nothing to do with this. And it could have been the girlfriend. It could have been the girlfriend's parents. It could have been anyone, right? So th these are all the reasons that I have a lot of problems with the cross-examination. Not asking any questions whatsoever are, I, I, I just don't see how that can be an effective defense strategy. The opening statement, while it was lacking somewhat stylistically, I think covered all the bases as far as what you're supposed to do for a client, but not asking any questions whatsoever, in my opinion, is not a good defense strategy. Two questions only on the first day of a double homicide, 
cannot be effective representation. I would love to know what you guys think in the comment section down below and I will talk to you later. Bye.